can really complement your reign so well. This is a recording of the Felicia Valley Link for uh, April 5th, 2023. Yes, and we're talking about the uh, Jerry's Brain Plus generative AI or ChatGPT project right. and you know what fits where, but we also just finished talking, and sorry we didn't turn the recording on earlier, the book project that Pete Kaminsky put in front of us uh, that's happening on, that where the conversations are happening on Monday mornings. Sorry, go ahead, Flancian. No, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, notes, I guess the recordings don't get the notes, but the, yes, in uh, the link in doc and our or. Um, so, right, no, I mean, about like the complement there, I guess, where like your your brain is a uh, very uh, link oriented, mm -hmm. very much the topic of the, all these calls, uh, the core, the core uh, mm -hmm. the motif. Uh, I think I complement, uh, it, it lends itself well, this experiment, maybe to uh, the crowdsource approach. Which is also, I think, key as a, or could make it very interesting as an experiment precisely in the generative um, uh, models area, because crowdsourcing, how we crowdsource in a responsible way that respects the sources that actually, you know, uh, yields explainable models or attribution and so on, uh, is very much key. And I feel like, I know, like an hour I like approach where, you know, like you could have some people contributing links and some people contributing notes, right? You could imagine like people, you know, going through your brain uh, <laughs> uh, to put it some way out actually explicitly and f filling in the null, uh, notes in the notes. Of course, you know, uh, we will need, you know, conventions and so on to do so. Right. But like uh, at a very small scale, we have seen this in the Agora where, you know, like the fact that someone wrote something even a stab somewhere makes it more likely other people will go and write their own thing. So it's sort of like calling attention to something. Right. Uh, and then it's essentially you, you, you will continue with approach that, uh, you know, fits uh, your brain and your workflows and other people could uh, do the same and the complement of uh, and the combination of all these use this corpus. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to talk about that sort of in more length and slower if we choose to go back into the topic because it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. To me. And I and I wish the brain had an API because right now there's no way to go create something and then add that back into the brain. That would be really pretty phenomenal. I have to do it manually, right? right? Which which actually sort of sucks um, because yeah, if there was a way of enriching the brain as I use it, like in the brain data file, then then I could make it so that the data actually gets more and more useful. Uh, oh, and I forgot to say, so the place we ended up on for the free jury's brain calls is an experiment where I'm going to take one or several um, brain casts that I recorded and posted on YouTube, which have transcripts. We're going to take those transcripts, map them to the thoughts that, that I point to as I'm busy giving a tour of some section of the brain. So I, I did one called SNP, which is all about the 2008-2009 global financial crisis, right? So I have wow. so I have 20 minutes, 25 minutes of uh, recorded video, and I can easily, even by recreating the journey through all the different thoughts, I can point to everywhere it points to in the brain, and we can feed that into ChatGPT as a cor as a small corpus and see what that does. Um, so we can kind of start there. Mm -hmm. um, right. Um, interesting. Yes. Yeah, so, so how what have you tried so far? I ChatGPT has this particular interface, right, where you have to provide the context and so on. And you could imagine, you know, there's three directions. One is a more ChatGPT direct uh, approach where you will say, this is like, a, you know, these are example links of a part of the brain. Mm -hmm. Can you complete a more links or, you know, like, or, or write uh, about these relationships, all these things, no? Uh, or, you know, continue this tour, the brain cast, you said, no? Mm -hmm. um, and the other will be, you know, I guess go for a more like fine tuning approach where you, uh, I guess, leaving behind ChatGPT for a while, we, you know, we focus on, you know, like an open source language model and fine tuning that, which has the different degree of like complexity, but also like payoff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, on the API side, it's, it, I, I heard that several times, Jerry, right? Like it feels like a, the, and there's no way the brain will do what you need. So, um, right. so we can scrape the brain. We've done a couple other things, and programmatically, I'm not nearly as smart as Pete and Bentley and Marc Antoine, who have done some things to basically get data out of the brain uh, through a couple of projects we did. One was called uh, Meme Brain, and another one was called uh, Brainy McBrain Face, just because we, <laughs> need, we needed a fun name. Um, and so that we've got, you know, we've got that code. Uh, 
Yeah. And then, and then I wanted to add a, a third project, which I, is more me, but fits everything we're talking about here, uh, which is uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, I realized that I'm, I'm the most cyborg person I know, that I have externalized more of what I think and what I believe than anybody I know. And gosh, I think the future of work has a lot to do with becoming a good cyborg, whatever that might mean, because we are going to increasingly need to be symbiotic with our software if we're going to be powerful. And I'm watching what people who have mastered ChatGPT are achieving with a couple of prompts and, and, and internalizing how prompt engineering works well. They're, they're generating things that would take a human several months worth of labor to, to create as a great starting point. And it's not a finished artifact, but oh my God, you know, it's just even being able to start from that place is, fab, is fantastic. So I created a, a presentation that I want to sell and make a living from uh, called um, and originally I was calling it uh, my life as a cyborg. And I had a conversation with a guy who said, great topic, boring title. How about something like confessions of a cyborg? <laughs> so that's what I'm calling it. And I, I own cyborgconfessions.com, but I haven't put much, <laughs> much on that. Uh, but I test drove this talk on Sunday morning because one of my buddies heard me mention this and said, hey, would you do it for our group? So Sunday morning early, I, I did the talk for like 40, 45 minutes and it went really well. Like it went, it worked just nice. great as a first pass, in, you know, including just as a first pass. Um, and then I'm really interested in the way that, that this symbiosis between us and software fits into all these other things that we're talking about and how it all works. Uh, and then last thing for my update, uh, Paul Roney and I keep having a little trouble uh, synchronizing to get the podcast restarted. Uh, but I'm still hot and interested in, in like getting hyper talk moving again as a podcast. And also because the artifacts I want that podcast to leave behind online are exactly the kinds of artifacts that we might use and reuse for a neo book that, you know, we can involve in all these kinds of, of projects. So that like mm -hmm. that, that, that is just a podcast that happens to be a series of interesting conversations that would feed the whole medium that we're trying to evolve here. So that, that's it. But those, those are the top of mind things for, for me right now that relate. Cool. I mean, I'm personally interested in, in all of these. <laughs> I need to read more about like, all well, these people that you mentioned, I guess. Uh, yeah, on the podcast in particular, I feel like, I mean, I, I'm pretty interested in that data uh, with a link to the book, in particular because, you know, the conversation we have here seem like they could yield at least some of the uh, primary matter for a podcast. Right it, it, after it and so on. Absolutely. So I guess I'm interested in setting out these pipelines. Yeah. On the podcast, I, I also have this a, a like a project uh, like drafted but shelved essentially, which will be like you know, can we get a draft a first draft of a podcast uh, like eat more easily uh, with a group of people by just going from a chat room with voice messages to like a, you know a composition of those. So essentially, like maybe develop like a simple tool so that you know we can like send back and forth ideas uh, asynchronously, and then you know you you get the, the first draft of the podcast uh, this way. Um, uh, so we have, I mean, we've got chat rooms effectively on Mattermost right, right now yeah. for all the different projects yes. I named. Um, yeah. So we could easily do that. Uh, and you yeah, you mean you mean just as a, as a way to organize, as a way to sort of structure things. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in general, like what I want to do is do this for Telegram, which is uh, more widely used, and like yeah. Matrix is what I use, but you know, I will look into matter most. But essentially, it's like a side project of a side project, I guess, as usual. But it will be like, you know, making it easier for people because a lot of people, like, I know people who just have like rules where they send back voice messages, right? With friends. I know having like a bot that says, like, I just, you know, I'll just like generate like a, a weekly podcast episode out of whatever you send. You that, um, right? that sounds great. And, and just using ChatGPT to sort of structure some of that or, or summarize or assess nah, it would be great. That'd be awesome. There is some some work on generated uh, podcast, which is really interesting. Exactly. And that was a proof of concept or like commentary, but I think there's going to be like interesting, you know, the interesting one are the ones where like you won't tell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, the, yeah. and also the way that Paul and I are trying to frame HyperTalk as a podcast is actually as a collection of different podcasts that are hosted by different people some of which might be four episodes long. Like, so, so what we're looking for is people who would like to pick up and say, hey, I have an idea for a, a topic that I think will last six, six episodes. 
And then they go record those episodes. We wrap it in a way that it looks like part of HyperTalk. Um, and then we, you know, Paul and I sort of act as both producers and also hosts of episodes and, other, and guests on other people's episodes or whatever. But in that sense, the calls we're doing here, if we made them a tiny bit more formal, could easily be podcast episodes ongoing. I mean, de de depending on what, you know, if we plan these calls a tiny bit more, I really like yeah. how unstructured and loose they are. Right. Um, but uh, this, th there's no reason this couldn't simply be the kinds of things we've done and talked about no. in, in Freedom mm -hmm. of uh, uh, Fellowship of the Link are really good fodder for HyperTalk. Yeah, I, I honestly think that if we went back and like, you know, we took like recurring projects we mentioned and recurring threads and said, you know, we're going to discuss these three in order every call. I think we will probably be most of the way there. Yeah. Just the, yeah, yeah. So like that. hold that thought for a moment. And yeah. And, and I'm really into the making a podcast, by the way. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. I love that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and I kind of want to put in the back of both your minds, like if you were made king tomorrow and could and had plenty of time and resources, which we don't, none of us have, but, you know, pretending yeah. that, what would your podcast be about? What would, like, how would you sequence like a half dozen or, or 10 uh, episodes? Yes. Who would be your guests? All that kind of thing. Wait, king or podcast then? Yeah. You, I thought you went just king. <laughs> Sorry, it's a very limited kingdom. The domain is very- uh, Okay, no, it's fine. I like, you're, I like You're it. already the king. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. What are, you, what are you using your powers for? If it's, it's like the king of sea land. You, you own a little oil rig right, that's, yeah, that's yeah. kind of old and decrepit off the coast of England. It's not a lot of territory. Right, right. And by yeah. the way, I read it. I was reading an article about Gerard Piquet this morning who is in reinventing soccer in something he calls the King's League, oh. which mm -hmm. is changing all the rules to make soccer, football, fit better the TikTok era. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like a really bad idea. But anyway, it's, it's intriguing. Yeah, reform is always interesting, I guess. Yeah. yeah. In baseball, they changed a bunch of important things like the size of the bag. And, and it's like, wait, what? Right. And they put yeah, a clock right. on the pitcher. Whoa. <laughs> I mean, they, <laughs> right. they can't stand on the mound and scratch their crotch for a couple a couple right. hours. And now, well, football now has bar. Yeah. And like I have all these conversations, you know, like, well, uh, where people are like, I don't like VAR. I'm like, what do you, do you don't like? The fact that it's rational and that yeah. it you have better goals? It's like, well, it takes away something. It's like, really? What does it? I, I, don't, mean, I, don't like so a, I don't like when a really, really awesome goal is disqualified because somebody's shoulder was an inch too far over the line. I'm like, you know, can you give it to Maybe. them? Can there be like a little grace there? Right, right. They should have one. The referee should have one call a, a year where it says, like, you know, the goal was beautiful right now. Exactly. But like, uh, it should yeah. be like a beauty, a beauty rating that influences the VAR decision would be right, right. Maybe or people can vote. Yeah, no, that no. would totally work uh, for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so I, I, I do have like a, a, a plan for a podcast uh, essentially. <laughs> yes. But so yeah, we'll have, have you to put share this in Agora? Does it have a thought in Agora that you can share? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, so what I've been doing, uh, I mean, just I don't want to take too much time, but essentially what I've been doing is trying to develop Flancia into a Pazam language. So, yeah, so it's number. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I have something else to check in on about that. Keep going. So essentially, I have like about like 51. It's, it's like Chris's video is going a little awry, awry but so yeah. am I. Yeah, yeah, it's like everything's like, so I think, uh, and, you know, going back to the Neo, uh, Neo book and so on, I think I was, uh, one of the things I thought is like, you know, a pattern language as an example for like composability of chapters and hypertext at the chapter level, right? Uh, which is what pattern language, the original one, uh, was uh, a bit like. So, yeah, so I have like about 50 uh, like um, uh, patterns, uh, depending, on how, depending on how you count. And my default is I'm going to make them into like books and like, you know, like uh, essentially, you know, slowly. And Essentially, anything that can map to a number sequence, for example, like podcast, <laughs> uh, that that will be my default source of inspiration, essentially. And and there's a way of easily imagining creating a podcast sequence where each podcast episode, in fact, explores and helps you record right. any of the patterns in your pattern language. Exactly. Oh my yeah. god. Oh my god. Okay, yeah, that, yeah. we need to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I, I found it very. Um, uh, like very fruitful and like you know, of course it's just inspired, right? Right by, by the people who proceed it, so make, it makes it beautiful. And like uh, yeah, but the language there. So nice. um, yeah, and it just seems like a generic. It's sort of like going back to generative. I guess it's a bridge for me in the sense that 
Uh, I mean, I would be happy to talk about this at length, but you know, I'm also like a bit um, idiosyncratic, so I don't know if it's interesting, but like essentially these numbers now means things to me. So, you know, uh, when I, you know, it's just the fact of me being able to like really commit to memory a, a, a relation between a number and like a topic or a pattern, it sort of like feels like a mind palace. And like uh, I've been using this quite a bit in over the last year or so. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm attracted usually more to the names of patterns than to the numbers of the patterns. Yeah. But, but yeah. same thing. It's a mnemonic. Chris, we keep yeah. talking and not letting you in. Uh, yeah. That's, no, no, that's well. okay. I, it's all good stuff. I don't know what my podcast would be. It, you know, it changes every two weeks. You know, what's the new topic of the week or the day? Right. Um, although, if I could, and maybe it's related to a different related thing in terms of playlists of things, particularly mm -hmm. because you were talking about a book or books. If I could wave my magic wand and say, here is a website with a bunch of interesting stuff on four topics, let's say of 5,000 topics it could have, crawl this site and spit out, you know, a book version of the five or six topics and then allow me because it, it, it's pretty easy within either caliber or mm -hmm. tools like sigil sig sigil will let you kind of rearrange chapters within an ebook to make ebooks and then you know you can hit a button and it's on your kindle and you're ready to go um but that could be mm. a super cool way of here or here's a list of five websites pull out all the data now and it may be one thing if it's like the new york times and you try and pull something from a really massive store but let's say my own website you know and even that has over sixty thousand posts on it but if i subsection it and say i want these four topics give me that as a book and then i can reorder it and then spit it out and you know create a pattern language to do that or to say go to wikipedia or go to the agora and give me this stuff right and then and then have a base of material you can play with that would be awesome right and it ties in really well to the generative aspect if you want to generate glue or or maybe in this first first pass, uh, when you are like just like uh, tying things together, generate connectivity essentially, and say this is where yeah, uh, that sounds amazing. Hmm. I don't hear you, Jerry. Oh no. Is that sorry? Right? I'm sorry. I, I I muted myself. A brief check in on pattern languages. Two different things. Yesterday I had a a, a repeat call with a couple friends. Uh, one of whom is Daniel Lindenberger, who is was part of the Liberating Structures Pattern Language Collective. And uh, the other one is Marie Bierde, who long ago worked at Qualcomm, but she's really interested in unmanagement. So unmanagement, writing a pattern language for unmanagement is kind of the umbrella topic for our calls. And mm. that's moving slowly, but it's interesting. And, and, people, and, and Daniel is, I think, skilled in writing pattern languages if you want to talk to somebody who does that. But then... Two weekends ago, I spent the weekend uh, with four other people, one of whom is Ward Cunningham, uh, the, the inventor of the wiki. All of the other people were deeply, deeply uh, enmeshed in Christopher Alexandrian thinking and pattern languages. Uh, one of them was Michael Mahaffey, who wrote a book about Alexander and does consulting around pattern languages and all that kind of stuff. It was a very interesting weekend, uh, and I'm happy to sort of uh, report more about it. But one of the angles we were taking, which is really strong for me, is how do we make pattern languages more accessible, more better known, and more more useful? And I think you might have heard me say some, something like this before, where the example I use is the one, two, four, all pattern from liberating structures. Have you heard me talk about that before? Okay, good. So yes. that's what I mean by in instrumenting or making patterns more useful. It's like, oh my gosh, here's a pattern that's instantiated as code and is in fact helpful to do a higher level of choreography than, than a, a junior facilitator might think of or be able to do that. But how do we do that for all these useful patterns? And then how do we take the process 
of thinking about some topic that has structure, distilling it toward patterns, and maybe here ChatGPT is super useful as well, because I, I can I easily imagine giving ChatGPT prompts that say, hey, my, the, the, the framework for my pattern language is situation, you know, a complication, solution, uh, examples, and take, take these free texts that Chris just put on this web page and create 10 patterns that follow this pattern frame. That's yeah. probably pretty doable, right? Or, or even one better is go into my notes and find things that are linked together on a certain topic and generate something out of that Man. that I can then edit, which is what, you know, everybody's going to want. And that's lately within kind of that broader note taking and wiki space. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's the UI hurdle everyone has is I have thousands, hundreds, thousands, millions of notes. What the hell do I do with them? How do I move them around? And it's, you know, I think one of the benefits of the physical old school index cards is you can move them around and play with them that way. But when you have it all as digital material, I don't think any of the note taking apps do even a no. half good job of yeah. allowing you to kind of go in and move things around and play. I, in general, it's hard to do spatial reasoning or apply or, or pattern matching and so on. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because that's, I think to me, that goes back to the embedding problem, which is so key to like, well, I mean, I, I don't want to just imagine at the, at the world level, but you know, embeddings are like a, a, a crucial, at, you know, like a machine learning. And like, essentially what we, what we do when we visualize, you know, organize things spatially in 2D or 3D and reason about that is like producing an embedding to some extent, you know, and um, I could imagine, you know, like you mentioned the links and this goes uh, 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 back to something I've been trying to do for long, but, you know, on and off as a side fun project, which is like, is this a side, project of the of the side project of the side project? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I should have like, yeah, I, I, I actually have like a graph of projects and, and, and it's all like, a, yeah. So <laughs> sorry, keep going. I, sometimes, yeah. Um, most of them won't happen, of course, but yeah, it's fine. And like, um, visualizing the avatar right in a way that makes sense it is a hairball currently in any and like you know that happens with many large graphs and like i'm sure you know like well i'm pretty sure that the chris is uh you know um a sixty thousand uh, post uh, like site it probably has good categories and you know probably uh, it will look better but i will still imagine that when you say things are linked together there's going to be complexity in extracting the good clusters to put it some way things that can like you know be taken apart and be understood and also be put planner to put it some way you know um, so i wonder if there is potential there for like this sense making toolkit to put it some way where you yeah. could say these are all the sources that are linked and we're going to share to some extent like the procedures to mix you know that sounds awesome yeah. um yeah. I subscribe to a few too many Substack pubs, for example, now, and the good ones, I read pretty much daily or weekly or however often they come out, and then I weave them into my brain, which is something the authors are not doing. So one of the things I can't stand about Substack pubs is that it's just a stack of newsletters you sent out. And Substack does nada, and I mean <laughs> nada, to offer context or power tools or anything. It's like, it is extremely primitive technology as far as I can tell. And, yeah. and so, so some of these authors works, I've like, like uh, Heather Cox Williams, um, uh, so Heather Cox Richardson, I read her like daily and weave, uh, you know, every day, what, how, how it all fits um, and a bunch and a few others, but that woven context is part of what we want to be able to share to tell our story. Right. So could that be automated? Can we get the tools to do the weaving for us or even on a, an existing corpus? That shouldn't be that hard. Hey, here's here's all of Heather Cox Richardson's newsletters. Go go find some links and make a mind map of how these things, what the dependencies are. That's yeah. pretty cool. Or, or even I want the edited version of what Jerry's read this week and the links he's made I and mean, maybe just the top 10 percent of those links and how they interact. And, have that. And, the, and that's the sub stack I want, you know, 
yeah. great as Heather Cox Richards and stuff is, I I wish I had time to read more of it. Right. But, um, it, it, I will say that is a I think the same problem affects social media, right? In the sense, you know, like another timeline. I mean, of course, like micro polls and like so on, like thinking of Twitter and Amazon uh, mostly, but like. Uh, essentially, you know, very very time based, sequential, not linked, mm -hmm. very hard to add context. And I I think the same opportunity for like building tools like complement is sort of like this huge space that is completely take uh, completely left open. Uh, maybe because uh, corporations haven't found a way to monetize it, <laughs> or or maybe it was against monetization in some cases. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we keep having uh, this, uh, you know, like very linear experiences. Mm -hmm. Scroll through the stream, right? Read this uh, post that one after the other. I find, I find most people are having a hard time imagining something which I call leveling up media. Like what's beyond what we've got now? And I, I, I'm not seeing a ton of creative experiments. Um, there's some old tools that seem more sophisticated than new tools, you know, like Tinderbox or DevonThink are, you know, visual mapping of articles and, and uh, Stephen Berlin Johnson's a big fan of DevonThink because it suggests connections across documents and he loves that, right? He uses it kind of as a brainstorming bucket. Uh, but that's just one feature that you want from these kinds of tools. It's like a one feature, it's a one trick pony, that software. So here I wonder, uh, you know, um, going back to Matthew and Peters, yeah. uh, I think many work on like the uh, tool for thinking map whether we, we got to a conclusion or we could get, uh, you know, next time on which are the best in each category. Because I think one was like visual, visual thinking, I think, or, yeah. Uh, so I, I wonder if we could like get inspiration from, you know, or, or, or there's tools that we can somehow reuse, I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the mapping project that they're doing fits very nicely into the infrastructure we're trying to generate. Right. So exactly. how, do, how does that work together? Sorry, Chris, yeah, go ahead. The part, I, Part of what's missing, I think, too, is we have all these linear inputs that we read. And you may absorb bits and pieces of things as you go by, but generally you're going to see the same things repeated over and over again. Or, you know, if you're on, let's say, old Twitter with their algorithm, it's going to rise up to things it thinks you want to see or that are being repeated multiple times. Um, but what's missing, and maybe it's it, AI can fix it or help it, but we are missing the ratchet for how do we take the pieces that we know and have context for, and instead of rereading them over and over and over again, because I guarantee over the next year, we're going to see rehashes of the same five Trump things that we've heard in the last day and a half thousands of times. And I don't need to see it thousands of times. I already have a, a base context of what this thing is. I, the, and there are people who are ignoring it actively and won't have that context. So maybe when they decide they want to dip in six months from now, they'll need that context so how do you give them that so that they can then ratchet up to the next level and build on it you know so you have the brain or i have a set of notes that is a pre-existing mass of data and i want to be able to plug that in and say here's you have my context now system you know and then i can go to substack and say i want to see interesting things in these I, uh... areas that are things I haven't seen before that will allow me to kind of get to that next level up. Um, yeah, uh, these are cool things. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, briefly, and I think this builds and sort of goes in parallel to what you were just saying, Chris. Um, the idea of generating pattern languages by looking at your work or something like that. Uh, one of the things that was coming into my head from that was, yeah, and how do we sort of reduce duplication of everybody's patterns, everybody's genius patterns? And there could easily be an application of ChatGPT or something like it to say, hey, who else's patterns does this look like? And can we can, can we consolidate date them or rationalize them or blend them such that a piece of my pattern language winds up being patterns that other people have written, but I love them because they encapsulate better patterns that I came up with on my own and then discovered 
were already somewhere instantiated, you know, in, in some other place. And, and then we create kind of like meta or polyglot uh, pattern agglomerations, uh, pattern pigeons, maybe, um, uh, or pattern trade pigeons? languages. Uh, pigeon language, yeah. yeah. There's dialects. Ah, pigeons, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, P-I-D. Um, yes. But that, that sounds really interesting to me because one of the things I don't want to see is each of us inventing all of this all by ourselves and creating these very elaborate but distinct and separate worlds of thinking. Makes complete sense. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, that looks very interesting. Life Ratchet. I'm like, uh, I added to the notes. Thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, on the direction of, uh, you know, bring your own context. Uh, which uh, is what you know. Uh, how I could summarize one aspect of what you were saying, Chris. Um, I guess, in my mind, in the the long the long game, you know, to put it some way, is in the user agent. I don't know if we got into the same conclusion, but like you know, thinking uh, in particular, thinking maybe a bit uh, uh, preemptively or uh, you know, cautiously, defensively about you know how uh, some entities you know are uh, different entities are like sort of sometimes tagging for control of the internet to some extent and so on uh, i i sort of feel that you know in the worst case we'll keep receding uh, into like uh, you know what there is no control and in the end it may be about the user agent meaning you know do we own the the browsers we use do we own, do we own the the actual tools we use to interact with our sites and once we get there uh, you know, that's essentially where your context will be. So, so to some extent, why doesn't the internet browser do this for you, is the question. Uh, before that, of course, an extension, to some extent, uh, could actually implement this as a, as a you know, V1, but potentially in the future, because extensions, unfortunately, are sort of like dependent on browser APIs, which keep being changed for a variety of reasons. Uh, it seems like owning the browser may be the only long-term insurance policy right and in that case then you could say well any any site you you interact with and you can imagine this going back in the cyber direction you may have like a generating model or agent assistant uh, engaging in most of your browsing sessions you go to a site you want to find something now you have control if that's what you have right yeah uh, 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 find some find something in the settings in amazon Right, I think this is something that is coming in the next few years, probably, where like we will actually have like you know these cyber, more like cyber browsing sessions, and here is like where you know that actually leads in the direction of of having that. I think Chris, you know, having the browser also react, negotiate with the sites, you know, what you actually want, your algorithms based on what you already know and have said interests you. Um, in, yeah. in some sense, I think Chris alluded to this a little moment ago, but in some sense, what we're describing here reinvents the algorithms that are currently part of the platforms we're, we're on yes. that are being done without our knowledge and behind our backs and often to manipulate or addict us. We're sort of describing some, some parts of crowdsourced algorithms and means of deduping our feeds so that we see what's new and what's different and not the 15 repetitions of the same set of six right. points uh, and also deduping our insights so that we can crystallize knowledge instead of each sort of running off in our own directions or something like that. But that, that feels like the part of the feed. Oh, and then there's context collapse. Chris, do you want to talk about that? Well, uh, I want the opposite of that. So you can go to social media and jump into a conversation and have no idea where the two sides are coming from. In fact, maybe they don't even know themselves where they're coming from or each other is coming from. Usually, most people at least have a good idea where they're coming from. But then they have a conversation and a third person may come in with no idea of any of their history or connections or any of that stuff. And the whole conversation collapses down because they're all missing that context. So how do you come in and be given even some quick prompts of, the context you're missing, where people are coming from, so that you can right. participate both meaningfully and in a, a kind fashion. Mm, yeah, and then yeah. and then yeah. allow you to actually have a context ratchet, so that once you've had that conversation or that thing, 
it's now part of your context and you can move on to the next level up. You know, simple things like poverty in America, we can't fix and it's worse and becoming even worse because the two political sides want to blame different things for it and neither one of them has any kind of historical context really of where we've even been to have the context to fix the problems and so more often than not we're treating symptoms mm -hmm. rather than treating the disease and if you could you know up that level of the context, a context ratchet which is you know the only way the only words i've got to describe what this thing is um or at least what seems smart there's probably a better phrase for it but how do we do that so that you can take the two or three things compare them and find the new idea right and, and actually move forward so this brings me back to something we discussed uh, 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 sometime before which is like the idea of like translating between meta models uh, right to like facilitate communication and you know like this pidgin language or like you know like common like this sort of like intermediate uh, pattern language could be like uh, in this direction as well so i wonder you know uh, in the case of that of you know like political discourse and debate and so on yes can, can you find words maybe new words or like uh, less politically charged words which haven't been used before but two sides could agree on right uh, to some extent or, or new framing and so on i don't know too too often i think we find whatever the new words are become the new weapon at least in the political sphere so right. you know i was looking at some myths of american history and one of the ones and it's in um kevin cruz's book new book uh, myth america m-y-t-h um, and they talk about the idea of American exceptionalism. And in the nineties, the Republicans beat the Democrats over the head to the point that they quit, quit saying it. And they said, and they uh, capitulated and said, yes, America is exceptional without any history of what's going on, just because it was politically expedient to do so. And I would posit, I don't think it's mentioned in the book at all unless it's much later than I've read to this point. But the, the phrase woke is a new word that essentially is that same idea of America, the opposite of American exceptionalism. We're not exceptional. Mm -hmm. And these are the areas we're specifically horrible at and we could become better at making things more equal, more just, more, you know, you know nobody's gonna pick themselves up by the bootstraps. It's an impossibility. But the word woke is now a, of the same word. It's the same meaning as saying America is not exceptional two decades ago. We've just invented a new word. And guess who, who has picked it up? They're using it now as a bludgeon in every marketing, everything to raise money or to say anything you don't like. If you're a Republican, just call it woke. And suddenly it's a bad thing. And so that prevents the two sides from ever coming together because that whatever that new word is, right. and probably in the, the case of woke, it comes out of uh, African-American culture, which makes it four times worse than American exceptionalism. And I'd be willing to bet you dollars to donuts. No one who uses American exceptionalism, unless you're a historian, realizes it, it comes out of early communism and apparently it was a, a phrase lenin used early on oh seriously yeah mm -hmm. and i was like when i read that i was like you know that's super interesting so it got the, the the history of it goes back to the 1920s in early socialism and then lenin picks it up um although i have found it it doesn't use the phrase american exceptional exceptionalism exceptionalism specifically but henry adams has a book on democracy from the 1880s where and it's a fiction piece where he's got i think it's a baron from the uk talking about america and how they think they're 
you know, the, the idea of American exceptionalism is there. And I have a strong suspicion that when he won, he died in 1918, I think, and his education book became a Nobel Prize winner the year after he died. And so I think a lot of people were going back and reading his stuff in the 1920s. And that's where the phrase got picked up and turned into hmm. this thing. So, <laughs> Interesting. Um, but you know, we're uh, without that history piece of it, everyone's lost. And then you're, you know. Important also is that the words don't just sort of idly show up and either pick up steam or not steam they are the subjects of intense pressure to use or not use them by political parties who are trying to make a point around the words or who are trying to diffuse a very effective word or who are trying to uh, reappropriate a word or whatever like this mm -hmm. is this is part of my junior history thesis uh, well theory is that um uh, human history is a fight in the in the cockpit over the joystick of, of who controls our society during the next stretch of time and uh, both of the parties usually there's like two but sometimes there's a few more think they're about to lose all the time they get really paranoid and really angry and and they take pretty extreme measures sometimes which sucks that's why human history is so lumpy um, but these words are crucial because the narratives in our heads are the tools for winning control over, um, over the, the, over policy, over everything. I, nine times out of 10 too, our general policies are not so horrifically far apart. I think we're, you know, some of the social media stuff drives us away. Yeah. You know, we need a little more you know, a, a little more manufactured consent, or at least manufactured consent towards the, the middle consensus. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, you know, we need, maybe that's what the agora should be doing. Time to go. No hope. <laughs> I, I don't know how you pull it off other than getting people back together again, you know, and disintermediating the algorithm. Yeah. My, my my hope is that, okay, so the short of the, <laughs> the working plan will be uh, try to like organize around like uh, fuzzy like clusters, which could be like, you know, you know, discover using pattern languages or some like uh, other thinking tools, try to identify projects where there's like high leverage opportunities. You know, I like, think like, you know, what we discussed about like writing context or like, there's a, a lot of these uh, possible projects we discuss, which seem to hint at, uh, you know, open niche niches. And like then essentially, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, go after some of these projects and try to set up a, a, a reinforcement loop or self-improvement loop, um, right? Uh, so that essentially, you know, people are more willing to maybe compromise, be open-minded in some context because that actually has some concrete like a uh, result like you know for example like access to a corpus or uh, you know access to a commons mm -hmm. uh, to put this on way and, and uh, oops i just did that wrong um and that's what the fight over books in our schools is right now right this very minute it's like what 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 is allowed to be in the corpus because it infects the body politic right right Right. And, uh, you know, the problem, too, is that, you know, most kids, kids are reading, but I don't think kids are reading nearly as much as they did even a generation ago. So, uh, do you, are you know, you, are you counting all of their texts and instas and TikToks? Well, yeah, th but that's that's a different read. That's a different. Oh, that's it. But it's words, right? It's words no. on its text. Oh, well, the I would say the level of the conversation is probably yeah. a whole, whole lot lower. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, reading books is a much yeah. better thing. And I, you're going to discourage some books over others or get back into the, you know, I somehow we have forgotten that book burning and book banning is a bad thing. And now it's it's suddenly it's a, a doable thing in the United States again. Have very remarkably short memories, like stupidly short memories. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's one of the things that if you were a Republican, 
who's you know banning all these books the one book you probably want, the one thing you want in your history books is probably hey burning books is bad and you know that's that's something that's in the history books although even in your american history book it's at the dead end and you probably don't ever get that far in sixth or seventh grade right you, you don't read far enough in to know that not nazis are bad <laughs> and in some school systems i understand like like germany lives and relives and thinks about uh, the, the the mess they made in world war ii all the time uh, on purpose because they think that that's the way to prevent it and they still have neo-nazis um and japan doesn't teach world war ii pretty much in schools is my understanding they just avoid it so so there was a moment where uh something happened they were shooting a, a documentary or a movie or something like that and the japanese actors who showed up had no idea what the movie was about because the movie was set in world war ii and they were like oh, these are new events what what what, what is this Wow. Kind of crazy. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to have to drop off What's on the a, today. It was also yeah. during. It. Oh, no, it was. I, that, I think that was also during a time, too, when the emperor was generally infallible. Right. And the Congress was making decisions there on Japan's behalf that mm -hmm. the emperor then rubber stamped. And nobody was willing to say the emperor's not got any clothes on while they're doing it. So it's also in a shame-based culture, we you don't want to admit you were wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but, and particularly when, okay, we, as a culture, we seem to have moved past that. So we won't acknowledge it versus, and I, I saw an article a couple months back too, that said it's much easier for Germany to admit wrong with respect to the Jews, because there are relatively few now left in Germany. So it's not like you're living with, you know, the people still as your neighbors that you have wronged versus in America, mm -hmm. it's much harder for us to say, yeah, slavery. We, I think all generally agree slavery was bad, but we won't let it go. Right because they're all still here with us. Right, right, exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm not sure how to stop the, uh, the recording.